Want to make sure you never miss a new release from the official Creepypasta.com YouTube channel again? Be sure to subscribe and hit that bell to turn on notifications. I just couldn't believe it. It was her. The woman of my dreams was standing just ten feet away at the copy machine, staring at me. Me, of all people. Her hair was red, and her eyes were blue. She was the true mock-up of an angel if there ever was one. She'd never noticed me before, yet here I was minding my own business, and now she was staring at me. Some may have called her stare a disturbed and angry one, but I could tell she felt the same way about me as I did for her. Sure, I may have been staring at her first, and that may be what caught her attention, but I could see the yearning in her eyes. She wanted me. For months I had watched her from the safety of my small but quaint cubicle. I knew every detail about her life, every single one. I knew when she had lunch, who her friends were, who she talked to, who she liked and disliked, and where she would be at any given moment of the work day. I even knew where she and her husband lived, as she and I both took the same bus to work. I didn't own a vehicle, and her husband took their car to his place of employment every morning. Even on the long bus ride to work, she never so much as batted an eye my direction. But today was different. This was my chance. I smiled at her, and she made a somewhat perturbed facial expression towards me. She then looked away in a seemingly disgusted motion. Love is a strange mistress. My mind was now racing with an unending plethora of emotions, coupled with large quantities of dopamine. My synapses were firing off at an alarming rate as I stood up and started walking to the copy machine. I felt such a strong need to reach out and touch her. Just before I took my final step in her direction, my boss came over and pulled her aside to discuss some work-related issues. My march was impeded, but the ever-growing desire in me remained constant. I needed to see her. Although we went to work at the same time, she always left an hour before I did, just in time to catch the last bus. I'd usually have a co-worker bring me home. Sometimes, in the summer, I'd even travel by bicycle. Right now, however, it was the middle of winter, and there was a storm coming tonight. A very big one. I'd have to find a ride to my house. By the time I finally punched out, my emotions were haywire with a reckless sense of longing. I truly had to see her again. She was waiting for me. I could just feel it in each and every one of my eager bones. I had to see her now. I didn't even bother to ask anyone for a ride home. I just walked out of the building and started heading towards her house. I knew the route by heart. I didn't have a jacket or a hat, but I was warm. It must have been love. What else could it have been? Surely it wasn't my button-up short sleeve shirt or my tie. I know it wasn't my khaki pants. It must have been love. I had a warm sweater of love to keep me safe from the bitter cold air of winter. I was not only warm, but elated at the same time. I was going to march all the way to her house so we could finally be together. My plan was perfect, much as she was. I guessed that it would take me three hours to get to her house, as she lived roughly ten and a half miles from work. With this in mind, I made long and firm strides in the hope of minimising the amount of time it would take me to reach her. While walking down Main Street in this fashion, I noticed a lot of shops closing up for the night due to the approaching blizzard. One of these shops was the local florist. An idea sprang into my aroused mind. I couldn't show up at her house empty-handed. That wouldn't be right. I needed a gift. One that would profess my love for her in material form. I needed a rose. I pushed the door open just as the florist was about to lock up. I startled the hell out of her. I grabbed the nearest rose I could find, threw down some money on the counter, and left in haste. I had a mission after all. I started power walking towards her house again, hoping I would beat the storm there. Before making it too far, I felt a sharp pain in my hand. I looked down, 
and saw droplets of blood splattered across the ground. It was the rose. I must have grabbed an uncut one, thorns and all. My palm was now bleeding profusely, but I kept walking. It was merely a wound received while attending to affairs of the heart. I was focused on the bigger picture. I trudged. I trudged through harsh winds, my pace never wavering. I could tell the storm was coming. I was now maybe a quarter of the way there. It was then that I felt the snow. It began falling at a swift and steady rate, making it almost impossible to see in front of me. Still, I pressed on. My love for this woman was insatiable and desirous. I needed her. I absolutely needed her. I walked and walked, feeling the sting of the snow on my bare face. After an hour or so, I noticed a mark on my arm. It was beginning to turn black. This was the onset of frostbite, I guessed. This in no way slowed me down. I still had my sweater of love keeping me warm, every step of the way. I neither felt the chill in my arm, nor did I care about the risk to my health. I had made up my mind, and it could not be altered. Not by a human, or by the frozen forces of Mother Nature herself. My arm became blacker and blacker as I walked. My other arm started becoming discoloured too. I could only assume my face was as well. This didn't bother me in the slightest. I only cared about the task at hand. As the gusts of wind turned harsher, I clenched the rose harder in my now grey hand. I was determined. More so than I had ever been. After another long and treacherous hour, I finally arrived at her street. This was it. My love would finally be reciprocated. I could hardly contain my excitement as I made my way over to her house. Luckily, her husband wasn't home yet. The lawn was covered in snow, but I could still see the stone walkway leading the way to the front door. I took a step onto it, but quickly fell to the ground, slipping on a sheet of ice. I landed on my arm. I didn't feel anything, but I'm sure that I broke it, as I couldn't move it one bit. I stood up and kept walking, calling out to her as I did. I hoped that she would hear my shrieks and come running out to see me. Just then, the front door to her house opened, and she walked out, proving my cries to be effective. She said nothing. She simply looked at me with the most frightened look I had ever seen. She raised her hand over her mouth in shock of what she was witnessing. I reached up and presented her rose. My voice was tired from yelling her name, but I managed to offer her a couple of words. For you. She stared at me for a second, just as she did earlier at work. Those eyes of disgust, that look of confusion, it was now turning into sheer terror. Love truly is a strange mistress. Before I could speak again, she began to scream. She screamed so loudly, in fact, that I felt a pain in my ears. This was the first time I had felt any pain at all during the long and arduous day. The second pain I would feel would be in my heart. I could tell that she was terrified of me. I may have looked odd and disfigured, but my love for her remained intact. Why couldn't she see this? Why was she doing this to me? How could she? Rage began to overcome my emotions. I couldn't handle the unrequited mess that had just been thrown directly in front of me. I could now feel the bitter coldness of the storm. I was now aware of my frostbitten skin as well. The immense amount of emotional and physical pain I felt at this moment caused me to lash out at my one true love. Using my good arm, I took the rose, thorns and all, and started beating her with it. I slashed open every inch of beautiful skin I could see. As the blood dripped from her defenseless body, she screamed once again. I kept slashing at her skin, over and over again, but she wouldn't stop. The sound of her voice pierced through the cold night as well as my ears. With one last swipe, I sliced open her throat with the rose. She finally stopped. 
Her lifeless body fell to the snowy ground. I lay down with her, trying to provide her with some warmth. She looked so faultless, so attractive. Her beauty was staggering, even after death. I smiled, happy that she was no longer screaming, happy that I had provided her with inner peace. She could now rest. We both could. I placed the bloody rose in between us and let our bodies envelop it. I looked at her eyes once more before closing mine. Maybe now we could finally be together. I was just a kid. I didn't know any better. Even if I could go back, what would I have done differently? Could I have changed what happened? Could I have done anything at all? Probably not. Even so, I can't help but dwell on the details. Some nights it keeps me from sleeping. I can only hope that sharing my tale will help ease the burden. I don't remember much of my childhood before my mother passed away. My dad told me she was struck by a car on her way to work. I was only four years old. Still, I know that I loved her. Part of me still does. It's a strange, lingering feeling that doesn't go away. As much as I loved her, I feel that my father loved her even more. I say this because my mother's death took an immense toll on him. Up until I was about ten years of age, he would have a nervous breakdown, tears and all, at least once a month. He never told me why, but I know it was because of her. Things changed a bit my tenth year. We moved out of that house, the one that reminded us of her. My dad pulled me out of the school system, and we moved into a cabin out in the middle of nowhere. It may seem a bit drastic, but it was clear that my father needed a change. He wasn't doing so well, and because of this, I didn't question his actions. From that point on, we lived a simple life. My dad took odd jobs here and there, and seeing as we lived up north, selling firewood was sufficient enough to supplement our income. That was my job. I would go out each morning with my dad's old axe and chop up some logs for our eager customers. It wasn't much of a life, but it was good enough for us. Comfortable with our new living situation, I was taken completely off guard one night when I heard the sound of crying coming from my father's room. We'd been doing so well, so why was he still in such dire straits? Before I could analyse the situation any further, I heard my dad get up and slam the door shut on his way out of the cabin. I was compelled to follow him. Peeking out the cabin's entrance, I saw my dad storm off into the woods, bringing with him an acoustic guitar. I'd seen the guitar before, and knew my dad used to play, but I'd never seen him handle the thing. I figured that those years were behind him. Curious as to what he was up to, I followed him into the forest. I tiptoed, making sure to hide behind trees and avoid stepping on leaves as I went. Eventually, we came to a small clearing with a creek running through it. Near the creek was a stump where my dad sat down and adjusted himself until he was comfortable. He looked down at his guitar, closed his eyes, and began playing. I stood in awe of what I was hearing, a haunting mixture of melodious vocals and the rustling of trees in the wind filled the forest. I knew he played, but I never knew he could sing. It was breathtaking, for lack of a better word. This went on as often as my dad had breakdowns in our previous house. Each night it happened, I would follow my dad out to the woods and listen to the beautiful song he'd seemingly written. I didn't know what it all meant, but I could tell, even at age ten, that it stemmed from a place of great pain. I could tell that the sombre, heartfelt tune was about losing a loved one. Whenever I tried to picture my mother, the image was always blurry and out of focus, almost as if what little memory I had of her was slipping away. Whenever my dad played his song, I could picture her crystal clear. 
it was the oddest thing. This brought me comfort and ultimately helped me come to terms with her death. I had hoped at the time that it was doing the same for him. Being 10 years old though, it was hard to tell what was going through an adult's mind. Many months passed. The routine was nice for a while. But one night, everything changed. I heard the usual swing of the cabin door, followed by a swift crack against the door frame. It was very loud, signalling to me that my father was more distressed than usual. I hastily made my way to the door in an effort to follow him, but I stopped for a moment when passing his bedroom. The door was open just enough for me to see the guitar leaning up against his bed. How peculiar. I wonder why he'd left it behind. In truth, there was only one way to find out. My dad was already at the creek when I arrived. He sat on the stump, motionless and quiet. He was in a sulking position, and his eyes were closed. Without his guitar or voice, the forest around him was void of sound. The only thing I could hear was the water in the creek as it trickled by us. Soon enough, my father began singing. I could tell it was the same song he'd always sung, but it sounded off. Without his guitar, the voice was muddy and out of tune. There were some awkward highs and lows that made my stomach turn. Though his eyes were shut, I saw tears force their way out and watched as they swam down his cheeks. Eventually, he stopped singing and broke down crying. What happened in the following moments will stay with me forever. As my father wept, something strange happened. A milky white fog danced across the water. At first I thought my eyes were playing tricks on me, but eventually the white smoke gathered above the creek and took shape before my very eyes. It was a spirit, no ordinary spirit mind you. It was my mother. My father stopped crying and instead began shivering. He opened his eyes and looked up to see the spectre. He almost fell backward in fear. The ghost of my mother reached out and began choking my father. His face went from red to blue before my mum stopped. He fell to the ground and vigorously gasped for air. I couldn't bring myself to lend a helping hand. I was stuck in a petrified state. My father began to crawl away, but it was no use. My mother began clawing away at him. She tore through his clothes and eventually his skin. I watched in horror as she reached into his body and ripped out vital organs. His bones snapped like branches. His blood tainted the water. His voice once again filled the forest. Only now, it was screams of agony. I couldn't bear to watch any longer, so I closed my eyes. With eyes shut, I remembered the song my dad sang. I started humming it to myself, and just like that, I calmed down. The world around me became quiet. All I could think about was the song, that beautiful tune. Memories of my parents came through the floodgates as I hummed. Tears rolled down my cheeks. I couldn't help but fall apart. What had my childhood become? Where was I to go from there? Eventually, I stopped humming and opened my eyes. The apparition of my mother was gone. My dad's open corpse lay on the stump where he used to sing. As the scene before me sunk in, so did my heart. It crawled into the pit of my stomach and made a nest. It would stay there for many years to come. I don't remember running back to the cabin, nor do I recall calling the local authorities. What I do remember is the look on their faces when they took me back out there and saw what I had seen. The sight of my father's body was a grisly one, that's for sure. It was unlike anything the town had ever witnessed. Still, it was taken care of in a swift and respectful fashion. In the coming months, the investigation came to an end. The true cause of my father's death was never determined. 
but that doesn't mean that there were no answers found. My mother's body was discovered buried beneath the creek. My father's axe was determined to be the murder weapon. One of the theories floating around town was that my dad was the jealous type. They think that he convinced himself my mum was having an affair and then he lost his marbles. Feeling guilty, he moved us out near the dump site so that we could be closer to her. I guess we'll never know the full story, but one thing is for certain. My mother had her revenge. <laughs>